and welcome to Thursday Night at New Life. My name is Amelia and this is Luke. Hi everyone, it is great to be with you and to come together to share more highlights that we've had from um, Thursday Night at New Life over the past few months. Uh, and also we're going to include some stuff pre-pandemic as well. Um, so we're going back to another Pew Talk that took place before all of this stuff happened. <laughs> Yeah, so looking forward to that. Yeah, that'll be good. And we've got some great things tonight. We're continuing our look at how to read the Bible. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at the Book of Mark. And um, we're going to be uh, having another item from Chris, um, Words We Don't Use. I'm going to be looking at Wisdom tonight. Right. And uh, we're going to have a sailor from Jill Shields. And she's going to look at Psalm 91. Uh, so a lot of stuff to fit in to tonight. Um, but should we start with a song? Yeah. I'll tell you what, should we start with a prayer and then we'll sing. Okay. <laughs> Lord, I just pray, speak to us tonight. And uh, we thank you that you're with us as we meet together like this. Like you're in every home that's watching. Mm. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, as we've watched some of the things we've seen before and maybe some we've missed, that Lord, you'll, if we've seen it before, you'll speak to us afresh. And Lord, if it's something we've missed, Lord, you'll inspire us from it. Yeah. And Lord, I just pray, speak to every one of us tonight. Amen. 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 So, should we have the first song? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to introduce it? Yeah. He is Waymaker. Is it Chris and Karen? I think it is. He is Waymaker from Chris and Karen. <laughs>
What a song. Yeah. Great song. It's uh, one of those ones that um, I don't think we'd sang it much before the pandemic, but it kind of became like a little anthem for us at the start, didn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. Um, I remember Chris and Karen recording it, uh, Dave Power recording it. We've done it live loads of times. And it was really just one of those songs that during the start of all of this, that encouragement to know mm-hmm. that he makes a way where there seems to be yeah. no way um, was such an encouragement. It's always great to hear that song. Yes. Lovely song. Such good words. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, really good. Okay, we're going to come to our next item tonight, which is how to read the Bible. Uh, So we're going to be looking tonight at the book of Mark. How do I read the book of Mark? Although this book is the second of the four Gospels in the New Testament, it was the first to be written, and as such is the basis and source for the work in the other Gospels. All the other Gospel writers would have read the Gospel of Mark. First of all, who wrote this book? Now, like in all the other Gospels, the writer doesn't name himself. Because the writers of the Gospels did not write them for the focus or the attention, they want that to be on Jesus. But the early Church Fathers all agree this is written by Mark. He is actually known by three names. Mark, which was a Latin name, meaning his family had Roman connections. This makes sense as they seem to have had a large house, servants, and appeared to be well-to-do people. In fact, their large house may well have been the location of the upper room where Jesus had the Last Supper. In Hebrew, his name was Johann, or John, and he was known commonly as John Mark. He also had an odd nickname, Kolobodokulos, a Greek word that means stubby-fingered, so Mark probably didn't play the piano. When Jesus was arrested, a young man who was dressed in nothing but a bedsheet struggled to get away and ran, leaving the sheet in the soldier's hands, fleeing naked into the night. This detail is a very strange one to include in this moment, unless this young man was John Mark himself. It seems that night he was in a great hurry to follow Jesus and the disciples. He followed them out of the house into the garden. In the garden it's likely he hid himself away and heard Jesus praying in the garden. This explains how the details of Jesus' agony in prayer that night are known even when he was out of earshot of the disciples, who themselves were falling asleep. But Mark himself is listening. Then at the arrest he ran away without his bedsheet. John Mark was not part of the main group of disciples. He was a young man, not much more than a child, when Jesus died. He was never a leading figure. He was not there when Jesus shared with his disciples. So where does his account come from? It seems surprising he'd write a gospel. Mark's main role in the early church was assisting others. He was an assistant to Barnabas and then to Paul. That one didn't end quite so well. And he ended up as an assistant to Peter around the time Peter was in Rome. He would translate Peter's messages into Latin. Remember, he had a Roman background. Therefore, it seems most likely that Mark's Gospel is Peter's account of the life of Jesus. Not dictated as such, but collected through Mark spending time with Peter and hearing all his amazing stories about his time with Jesus. The result of this sometimes means that the Gospel of Mark has been known as the Gospel of Peter. When was it written? Well, it was probably in the late 50s to early 60s during the Roman persecution of Christians, when Peter was still in Rome. So before we dig a little deeper, let's sum up this book in one sentence. Jesus is the Son of God, the suffering servant who came to serve all people and did so through his amazing words and his amazing actions. Why did Mark put pen to paper and write this gospel? Well, this book is specifically written to explain to people 
what Jesus did and who Jesus is, the Son of God. The first line in the book says as much, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. By the way, this translation says Jesus Christ, some say Jesus the Messiah, they are both ways of saying the same thing. The term Christ was commonly understood to mean Messiah. It was not Jesus's surname. This is the only time in the writing that Mark actually gives his opinion. The rest of the book, he shows us what Jesus said and did to prove this statement to be true. Mark is the briefest and most active of the four Gospels. He is writing to a Gentile or non-Jewish audience and portrays Jesus as a man of action and miracles, healing the sick, controlling nature and battling the power of Satan. He shows Jesus as God but in the form of the suffering servant from Isaiah 53 and shows the opposition that came against Jesus even from his own family members. You can nickname this the action movie gospel with its fast paced writing. The word immediately is used over and over again. Interestingly, Mark doesn't cover the birth of Jesus. Maybe Peter had not heard that story. Jesus himself never talks about it in his teachings. Maybe it's a deliberate choice not to be concerned with Jesus as a child, because he arrives in this story like the start of an Indiana Jones movie, already a fully formed man of action. At the start of this book, Jesus arrives, is baptised, and the mission is on. This book contains three main parts. Part 1, Galilee, Part 2, On the Way to Jerusalem, and Part 3, Jerusalem. Part 1 is two and a half years, covered very quickly in nine chapters, and is a very fast-moving style, seeking to excite the reader with event after event. Then in Part 2 it slows down and spends more time with the last six months of Jesus' life and then it slows down further in Part 3, spending its last six chapters on the final week of Jesus' life, leading up to the moment of his death. And when it comes to his death it describes every hour, every moment. It's like a train slowing and coming to a halt right in front of the cross. The structure of this gospel builds everything up to Jesus' death because the crucifixion is the main event, the greatest action, the climax of the mission. It's probably the best gospel to give a complete outsider who knows nothing about Jesus and wants to read about this exciting person who is our saviour. Mark ends with the resurrection and it's here there is sometimes a bit of confusion. You may have noticed some Bibles will have a note that says this. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 16, 9 to 20. What does this mean? Some see it as a conspiracy. Did someone add the accounts of the risen Jesus? Well, that doesn't make a huge amount of sense as Jesus is clearly as indicated as risen before this section takes place and the book often makes the point about Jesus dying and rising from the dead. You could say that's the reason the book exists in the first place. Or how about a different conspiracy? Why do some Bible publishers want to create doubt in the reader as whether this happened or not? <laughs> the reality is probably not as controversial as either of those views. It is more that the publisher is doing their due diligence because some of the earliest available copies of the manuscript do not include this section. Why? In the original, these early manuscripts end in the middle of a sentence. It actually ends with the phrase, for they were afraid of... English translations tidy this up and saying they were alarmed or they were afraid, but still it ends very suddenly in the middle of a sentence, which seems like a very strange way to end a book. Almost as if the last page is missing, which of course could be the most logical explanation. 
Documents were written in two main ways at this point, on a scroll or in a codex. A codex is pages bound together in a way close to a modern book, or like a document with treasury tags holding them together. For a scroll, then the end cannot be missing unless deliberately torn off. But a codex can have issues with missing pages, just as anyone who's tried to put a document together with treasury tags surely knows. Paul's letters were often collected as a codex. It was easier to look up parts of it than it would be on a scroll. If Mark was also collected and sent with a codex, then the missing page at the end makes sense. If the page was missing in a version that was copied early on, and the dedicated people copy and copy it exactly, it would have a missing element and end mid-sentence. Then, if a version that did not have that page missing became the standard to copy from some time after, then the newer versions would have all the extra pages that the earlier documents would not, and the newer versions would be the correct ones. It's a simple explanation, although there are others. The point is we need not worry about the authenticity of the longer ending as it was a valid part of the word of God, it was accepted by the early church and it does reflect early Christian teaching. This gospel focuses on the actions of Jesus and the amazing things he did. It's keen to show non-believers how there has never been anyone else quite like Jesus and that we should all come to faith in him. It presents the basis for this faith in a clear, vivid and compelling way. It also speaks to those of us who follow Jesus about Christ's nature and his work and the need to respond to his work with trust. Being the shortest, it is the easiest gospel to read in one sitting and therefore is a great gospel for reaching out to the lost, showing them Jesus, the amazing man of action, the Son of God, the suffering servant, and the hope of the world. So I hope you all enjoyed that, how to read the book of Mark. I hope you all find that um, helpful. I've had a couple of people text me in the past about how helpful they find those. So, um, yeah, I think they're good. Good. And thank you, Church, for encouraging us as well. Mm -hmm. Um, We really appreciate that. Yeah. Right, okay, we're going to go to um, one of our items that we ran. This was a kind of a recent item that came in uh, that Chris um, had a oh, whole yeah. bunch of these ready. Um, so thank you to Chris for, for doing these. And this is Words We Don't Use. And tonight he's going to look at wisdom. Hello, church. Um, I don't know about you, but I often think about um, the words we use. And and sometimes I like to look at those words. We we, we either don't use them as much as we used to, or we kind of seem to be using them in the wrong way these days. And uh, one of those words, which I I just want to have a short talk with you about, is, is wisdom. And, you know, the most I see wisdom these days is probably on a toothbrush. The wisdom toothbrush, you know, and, and I don't really, it's not a word we really use much. It's not a word we, we hear so much these days, and yet it's such a powerful word in the Bible. And um, one of the places we probably all know and share in, in this knowledge is Solomon's wisdom. So in 1 Kings 4, verses 29 to 30, it says this, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight, and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sands on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East, and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. And it's hard to imagine just how insightful and full of wisdom he was. It must have been amazing to just to sit and listen when he spoke. And, and one of the things that had come to my mind was this, that wisdom was not made by men. See, we think that people are wise because they're self-made, but actually in this scripture we see that God gave Solomon wisdom. You know, the Psalm 111 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
So we, we, we actually have a place in the psalm, and actually this psalm is probably worth memorizing. It's only 10 short verses, and um, it just helps us to praise God that he has chosen to exercise his power to redeem and care for us. But here we see the beginning of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we actually can find a place where wisdom begins for everyone. Because, you know, everyone can come to the Lord. Everyone can know the Lord. So therefore, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We see a place of beginning here. Because sometimes we don't feel wise or we don't know what's going on. But scripture actually tells us that it can be found. We often think, you know, wise people are very learned or they've read a lot of books. And, and maybe they have. But here in scripture it tells us something deeper. That there is a, a wisdom to be found in the things of God. In Colossians 2 verses 2 and 3 it says, My goal is that they might be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they, might, that they may know the mysteries of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we find what we need once again in Jesus Christ. And we see that Paul tells the Colossians, here is a hidden treasure that you can have. So it's not really that well hidden. It's hidden in Christ. If you walk with Christ, you will find the treasures hidden there. And one of those treasures is wisdom. And wisdom is something that we need more of. It's something that is a gift from God and we should seek it. Worth thinking about it. Next time you hear the word wisdom or next time you're cleaning your teeth, perhaps think about where wisdom comes from. God bless you. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, these um, words we don't use enough or words we use in the wrong way, I think they're, they're great little pieces yeah. that uh, just give us this, this little insight to how we view some words. And uh, wisdom is an important thing. Mm -hmm. It really is. So thank you for that, Chris. Next up, we have a sailor coming. And uh, I've enjoyed sailors. I, I know we're just talking about how much we've enjoyed all the pieces. <laughs> but I think once we started developing it in this structure and we found our rhythm with it, I've really found these helpful and, uh, you know, these little moments where we just look at a psalm and, and explore it. And, yeah, yeah uh -huh. I think they've been really helpful. Yeah, I like them. I like the, the different little segments we have and they all have their little title and their... <laughs> Yes. pictures which might be a little bit extra in terms of what we're doing but you know <laughs> if you're going to do a job you might as well do it right yes <laughs> <laughs> sorry after you. i was going to say that each one yeah brings out something different and um yeah good <laughs> bro okay well we're going to go to sailor now and uh, jill shields is going to talk about psalm 91 like us to look at Psalm 91 together. Let's just read it. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the foulest snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. 
for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. This lovely psalm is a psalm of security. We're not sure who wrote it. Many say Moses did because he wrote the previous psalm and the Hebrew tradition said that if an author is not named, then it is probably the same author as the chapter before. I grew up with my mum often talking about this psalm. One story she often told was that when she was a nurse on night duty, the sister over her was really nasty, nasty to her especially, and made her life miserable. She read verse 5, which in the authorised version reads, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. And she took that to be the night sister and was comforted. <laughs> It certainly is a passage that gives complete assurance in any and every circumstance that comforts and sustains us whatever happens. There are, though, some conditions and we need to apply these conditions to, uh, to know the assurance of this psalm. In verse 1 and 9, it talks about we need, that we need to be abiding or dwelling or living in the Lord, the Most High. The word abide here, loom, or loon, uh, it means literally to stop, usually overnight. Therefore, it means to stay permanently. To experience this amazing security of this psalm, we need to be permanently close and in the Lord. That is the only place of security and assurance. In verse 2, we read we need to trust him, to be confident in him and sure of him. It's no good abiding in him, then when trouble comes, becoming fearful. That's not trusting him. Can you say about the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, fortress my God in whom I trust? In verse 14, it says we need to love him. Now, in the original Hebrew, this is not one of the words we know for love, but a word, korshak, which means to cling, to desire, to delight in, to join with. The King James Version terms it, set his love on. It describes a deep and passionate commitment to the Lord. And finally, also in verse 14, we see that we need to acknowledge his name, this means to recognise who he is, to truly know him, so that in every situation we give him the credit for our safety and security. We honour him as being the one who fights for us and keeps us. There's so much to learn from this wonderful psalm. Each line is full of promise. So I just want to put, pick out two aspects. The first one is verse 4, where it says, He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. You may have heard this story about a fire that hit a farm. Many of the animals perished and the farm buildings were totally destroyed. When the fire service were going through the rubble, they found a dead chicken, charred and burnt. As they lifted, it, however, from underneath crawled some tiny chicks, totally untouched by the fire. The chicken had covered them over with her body and given her life for her chicks. What a lovely picture of our Lord who gave himself for us. Finally, I want to share a story from my life that has made this psalm very special to me. In 2013, I went to Congo for the third time to put in a large septic tank for the Bible college I was building out there. I took two guys with me, a pastor friend and one of his congregation who was a builder. The situation in Congo was always dangerous and I always went out against foreign office advice due to the continuing troubles out there. 
I went because I felt it was what God called me to do. I knew there was a security team at the missionary compound where we stayed who kept an eye on the situation around Bukavu, the town we worked in. Before I left the UK, I had received various prophetic words and scriptures from the people in our church. One young lady, Laura, had given me Psalm 91, and she said, especially verse 7, At the time, I must confess, I didn't see too much significance in it. I was very familiar with the psalm, and knew generally it was a psalm of security, which I needed out there. While we were there, the situation was deteriorating, and one evening the security team told us to pack our cases and to be ready to move out at a moment's notice. A rebel group had gone into Goma, a town about 100 miles away, and massacred many of the town's population. This rebels group, rebel group's intention was to come down the main road into Bukavu, where we were, a journey that would take about two hours. So we did pack our cases, but we also prayed. We were in the middle of our mission with a tank half built and I was in the middle of a series of teaching to the students at the Bible College. When we were in prayer, I suddenly remembered Laura's scripture and got my Bible out and read verse 7 to the guys. And this is what it said. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. It gave us a real sense of peace. We went to bed that night and slept. In the morning, we heard from a missionary on the compound that the Congo army had gone into Goma and killed all the rebels. They had then raped women and destroyed homes in the town of Goma, which was shocking and which is typical. However, for us, the danger was past and we could continue the mission. Verse 7 of that psalm had come true. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. How wonderful for us, who abide in the Most High God, that we can trust him and know assurance in every situation. Whatever you are facing right now, I trust that you will cling to the Lord, live every moment in him, and trust him to keep you. Don't be afraid. Know that he is with you. God bless you. Thank you for that, Jill. That was lovely. Really, um, really helpful and inspiring. Yes. Yes, thank you very much for that, Jill. Okay, we have one more item for the night. Um, and this is a pre-pandemic pew talk. <laughs> it's not labelled as such. It's just labelled as a pew talk. Um, but this was one of the ones that we recorded in the church. Oh, it feels like a long time ago now. Even just watching uh, through them, it's yeah. like, oh, that feels like a long time ago. And it really, <laughs> it isn't really. Um, but this yeah. is Terry Trotter. And uh, Terry gave us a great talk on Nehemiah. And uh, I thought there'd be many people who haven't seen this one before. Mm-hmm. So I thought it would be great uh, and encouraging to watch this now. So please enjoy this. This is Terry Trotter talking about Nehemiah. I'd like to talk to you about Nehemiah. So if you bought, brought half a Bible, you probably brought the wrong half. <laughs> right? So it's about Nehemiah. You know that it's written in 2 Timothy. All scripture is given by God, by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, and I would like to put the bit in brackets, the woman of God too, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for all good works. I believe this book is truly inspired by God. It's full of insight and it's full of instruction in how to live in a way that's pleasing to him. And he has the ability to lead us into knowing him more fully through that book. 
I find it interesting that I actually came to know him in the middle of Exodus, which might sound a bit strange, but that's another story for another time. So I'd like to talk to you today about some of the history of the children of Israel. We were grafted into that vine through what Jesus has done, through the redeeming work of Jesus. And I think we need to learn something from their history that can be applicable to our today. We might have all sorts of amazing technology around us, all of this, but we're still the same kind of people that they were a couple of thousand years ago. So I'm looking at the book of Nehemiah. So I'm going to go back in time. The date is around about 444 BC, so it's, it's a little way back in time. The place is Susa, which is in modern day Iran. It's been around about 70 years since they were taken into exile by the Babylonians. And although several of them have been allowed to come back to Judah, to Israel, they'd returned to a land that had been devastated. Jerusalem was laid waste. It, lay in, it was in ruins. Yeah? When they returned, the temple had been destroyed too. The people there were living in a place that was ravaged by Israel's enemies. If you can imagine one of those places that you see on TV, and we've all seen them, of places where entire cities have been destroyed by wars. It was like that. The walls were down, the temple was destroyed, buildings were destroyed. And there were some people still living there. And although some of them knew that the reason why it had happened had been their own disobedience. It didn't make it any easier. Now Nehemiah isn't a king, he's not a priest, he's not a prophet, he's got a job. It's working for King Artaxerxes and he's the cupbearer, which may not seem like much of a job, you know. If you, were, you, know, if you were, went around today's population and said, well, you know, what are you and Oh, I'm such and such, what are you, I'm such and such, what are you, I'm the cup bearer. People would look at you a little bit strangely. What, you just carry cups around? Well, that wasn't what Nehemiah did. It was actually a high-ranking position in those days. Because kings were often poisoned. So whoever served king, the king drinks needed to be thoroughly trustworthy. And the cup bearer, moreover, usually had to taste whatever he was giving the king, whether it be wine or other drinks. And so he's putting his life on the line every day for the king. He's got to be trustworthy. So that's the, the bit, of, bit of the background. Now Nehemiah's brother has been back to Jerusalem. He's been one of those that's gone back and he comes back to Susa, meets up with Nehemiah, and Nehemiah says to him, well, what's it like over there? You know, how, how good is it? How bad is it? And he asks about who survived the exile and the state of Jerusalem. And his answer is there for us to read in Nehemiah 1, verses 3 to 11. And it's quite appalling, really. And he says, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned by fire. And Nehemiah says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you, day and night, for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my fam father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. That's, that takes something to say that to God. But then he says, Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. Oh, wow. So, you know where all this has come from. But then he says, 
quoting again, but if you return to me and to bear my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Yeah, it's not one part of God's word, it's, it's both parts. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. He's going back to the Exodus. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And he says, and I was the cupbearer of the king. I think it's instructive that Nehemiah's reactions were not to get up when he heard about this, instantly put on his coat and try and go to Jerusalem and fix the state of affairs there. He wept and he mourned and he fasted and he prayed and then he speaks those words to God and he says, this is what I've got in mind. Will you give the king a willing ear when I speak to him? So it's been four months actually from the time that his brother talks to him until the time that he's actually in the presence of the king and things start happening. So presumably he's seen the king on several occasions but today he sees the king and the king says you're sad. You're not ill. So he asks him what's wrong. And again it, it's, I think it's instructive of the relationship that they must have had. You know, the king is actually asking his cupbearer, what's wrong? You know, you're looking sad, but you're not ill, so what's, what's up? And there Nehemiah replies in, in chapter 2, verse 3, Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ru ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And so the king asks Nehemiah what he wants, and Nehemiah prays. Presumably one of those little arrow prayers that you get when you have to give an answer to somebody and you really don't know what you're going to say next. So the king says, okay, well, what do you want? Help! And God gives him the words. He says, if it pleases the king and if your servants found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And the king does grant his request. So Nehemiah must have been both trustworthy and well thought of by the king. And, and he travels to Judah with letters from the king granting him and others safe passage. And requests that Nehemiah be given materials to rebuild the city. When he gets there it's bad. Really bad. Moreover those around who, who, there are those around who don't want it rebuilt. They like it just the way it is. With the Israelites in a subservient position, Jerusalem destroyed, nothing to fear. Nehemiah tours the walls of the city by night. He doesn't even want to do it by day because there are people there who don't really want him to do anything. And that's including some of the people who were living there. Some of the, the Jewish people who are actually living there don't want it rebuilt. And then he speaks out to the people, the priests, the nobles, the officials, officials, and he says in Nehemiah 2, verses 17 and 18, You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, and what the king had said to me. So he says, this is disgraceful, guys. This was the city that was set on a hill by God, given to us, into our hands. David took this city. And it's a disgrace now. The walls are destroyed. The gates are burned with fire. How can we live with this? But God's been gracious to me already. Look at what I, I've actually got. I've got you know, the ability to actually get people around us to give us materials to rebuild because I've got this letter from the king. 
And so they replied, let's start rebuilding, and they began the good work. So they built, rebuild the walls, or start rebuilding the walls, and the thing to see here is that individuals, families, groups like the priests, in fact all manner of people, commit to rebuilding individual sections of the wall. It's not that there's a, you know, a building gang on, you know, and you just build a bit of wall that you're told to on that day. Individual groups and people start saying, I will rebuild the wall by the sheep gate. I will rebuild the wall by this part. Yeah? And I think it's also interesting, in an age where women are often dismissed, there it actually says in Nehemiah 3 verse 12, Shalom, son of Holahesh, why they couldn't be called John and Fred, I'm not quite certain. <laughs> Ruler of the half district of Jerusalem repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. Now maybe he didn't have sons. But the Bible says it's his daughters. The task required everyone to be involved. Male, female, no exceptions, no one's excluded. So the building work continued and then came the inevitable opposition both from the Jewish people and from outside of them. When the walls were about half height they needed that they were going to need it to be and the gaps in the wall were being closed. Those opposed plotted to come and fight against Jerusalem. And in Nehemiah 4 verse 9 it says but we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat prayer and vigilance go together yeah. it's not just one it's not just the other it's both and at this time it's very hard work and Nehemiah encourages them yeah. don't be afraid of them remember the Lord who's great and awesome and fight for your families your sons and your daughters your wives and your homes when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. But from that day on, half my, work, half my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows and armour. The officers po posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me, the one who could call people. Then I said to the nobles and officials and the rest of the people, the work's extensive and spread out, and we're widely separated. It's a big building site, this. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. And so we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. And at that time I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so that they can serve as, as guards by night and workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. They didn't stop. They didn't take, you know, Sunday off. Saturday off, Tuesday off, they just kept on going. You know, there was a fight to be fought and they kept on going. So after 52 days of building, the walls are complete. The city is secure. But the houses are still to be rebuilt and populated. Half the, the people in the town are no longer there. The temple needs to be rebuilt. But that forms part of a longer story of how Nehemiah oversaw some of those works and how the nation itself was restored. We might ask why it hadn't happened earlier, when other groups had returned to the land. Perhaps the answer is that Nehemiah brought vision and prayer and emperor's resources, leadership and perhaps most importantly of all, God's involvement. It was the right time to do it, God's time to do it. Now we've only talked about four chapters in this wonderful book, in a little bit of history. But I think there's a wealth of things we, sh we can learn out of those chapters and from the history that Nehemiah wrote. So here's some thoughts. Not surprisingly, mourning and fasting and praying about what's happening are opportunities for God 
to share with us what he actually thinks about the situations we're going through. Like Nehemiah, our first response should be that of looking to God for his thoughts on the matter and not rushing to fix the problem. He was already aware of it and is aware of it now. We should be aware of what God has already said about situations that we and others find ourselves in. What he's already said to us in this book. Sometimes it may be necessary that we need to confess our sins and seek his forgiveness. Because we've just taken a left turn. We should remind ourselves of the promises of God to his people and to us individually. And claim or reclaim them. There are over 5,000 promises written in here. Yeah, some of them are condition up, conditional on our obedience, I know that. But there are 5, 000, over 5,000 promises where God says, I will do this, either to individuals or to his people. So, we should, uh, we should um, think through those things. He's said them, so they must be true, even if we don't see them at the present point in time. Fourthly, we, we, we don't have to be a leader or a pastor or a priest to hear the word of God and to do and say the right things. You are the one in your place of work or your situation, wherever that happens to be. It's not someone else. So only you can speak out the right words at the right time. If Nehemiah hadn't spoken out to the king, then the walls would have stayed in a ruined state until somebody else had heard from God and spoken out. Sometimes we need to make those arrow prayers in the moments before speaking out. God's listening and he will respond. He made out Xerxes amenable to Nehemiah's request. I'm fairly certain that what you ask will be a little bit easier for him to solve than let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then individuals committed to build what they could. It didn't matter how small the section was or how large. They did what they said they would do. We need to build the peace of the kingdom that we are assigned by God. Others will have their own sections to complete that's their problem. Yeah. We all have a unique part to play in building this kingdom. So it's, and it's assigned to you. And sometimes we'll have to carry on in the face of opposition. There will be times when we need to have our sword in one hand and a trowel in the other hand. These people were balanced. They could both defend and build. It wasn't all fighting and it wasn't all building but they were prepared to do both and we need to be too and finally sometimes there will be some building whilst others are guarding their safety we should think about the situations where we can guard someone else in prayer or tell others when we need guarding in prayer it's not just leaders who need our prayers so don't ever be afraid to sound the trumpet and call others to fight alongside you we were never intended to wage this war, this battle alone. Share your needs with your life groups. And then, like Nehemiah, we will be able to see, say, our God will fight for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for that, Terry. That was great, wasn't it? Yeah, really good. Great. I remember when we recorded that at the time as well, we were uh, getting some feedback from people going, you know, that was such a, a word for now. But yeah. I think also it's a word for now, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, as we're rebuilding and, uh, you know, coming back to church now and trying to rebuild everything that we, we know of as church. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, a, it's an important word. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, that's all we have time for tonight. Uh, I hope that has been encouraging. I hope that has been inspiring. Do you want to just pray for us, hon, before, yeah. we, before we close? Yeah. Lord, I thank you that we've been able to share this time together. Lord, I pray that you will bless everything that um, has been brought before us this, um, this evening, Lord. And I just pray that it will bless us and it will um, draw us closer to you. 
please keep everyone safe lord and bring us safely to church on sunday amen 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 bless you everybody i hope you have a wonderful week we look forward to seeing you on sunday yeah uh, we're starting our new series off on sunday tenets uh, which is about the tenets, which is the fundamental principles, fundamental beliefs of our faith. Mm-hmm. We're going to be going through our statement of faith as a church, bit by bit, and exploring those. So this Sunday, I'm going to start us off by talking about the Bible and the inspired Word of God. And uh, I'm looking forward to kicking that yeah, off. Yeah, be good. So have a great uh, few days. We look forward to seeing you in church. Or online. <laughs> uh, incidentally, this week, hopefully, online is going to be a little bit different. This will be the start of the new season of what our online looks like. The word will still be live, um, and the end of the meeting will still be live with all that part, but it'll be a little different at the start. And we're just going to test that out and see how that yeah. goes. Um, so you can be either with us in person, no more booking in, or live. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again on Sunday. God bless you, church. God bless.